Today I'll be making whole food plant-based bread using 11 different grains and comparing the results. I will be grinding these grains on the Country Living Grain Mill. I will not be using any animal products, eggs, oil, or refined sugar. The 11 grains that we will review are emmer, and this is an older ancient type of wheat. It does contain gluten. Spelt. Teff. Teff is a really small grain, so this may be challenging to grind it on my mill, but we're going to give it a try. Corazon. Corazon, it also goes by the name brand Camus, spelled K-A-M-U-T, but the generic is actually Corazon. We'll be doing rye. Everybody's familiar with the dark kernels of rye grain. We'll be doing einkorn, another ancient wheat, amaranth, another small grain, hard red spring wheat, millet, here, and buckwheat. This buckwheat has the holes removed, that's why it's light colored. If the holes were still present, it would be dark. And finally, corn. So this is a white corn that I purchased from Azure Standard. I've also purchased their blue corn as well. But normally I will grow my own corn on my farm here. So I just have to show you how pretty this corn is that I grew here. It's called Mandan Bride. And it's a rainbow colored or multicolored corn. So that's something that I normally grow here and will, and will grind into cornmeal myself. But we've had a drought the last three years, so the challenging growing conditions have been challenging, to say the least. So I did occasionally have to purchase some corn. So I can't wait to get started with all 11 of these grains. We'll, we'll bake them in different combinations. And we're going to explore the results together. 11 grains total in 14 different combinations, totaling 28 loaves. The same recipe and same cook time is used throughout. Real life examples, both good and bad. Part one is a bread making lesson using this recipe, and part two is the grains. The recipe and all materials used will be in the video description. So the first grain that we're going to showcase is millet. Millet has a light, mild flavor, and it will add a delicate or crumb-like texture to your finished baked goods. Because millet does not contain gluten, it would not rise in a bread by itself. In other words, I can't use 100% millet flour to make a bread. But you can use millet for up to 25% of the flour used in your recipe. So today I'm going to use one and a half cups of millet flour, and I'm gonna combine it with five and plus cups of the hard red spring wheat, which does have a good gluten content so that it will rise better. So we're combining millet with hard red spring wheat. I'll be grinding it on the Country Living Grain Mill. I love my Country Living Grain Mill, it's great. It's definitely a long lasting mill. And I'll be using these Rubbermaid containers underneath the, underneath the mill to collect the flour. So first we're gonna start off by grinding the millet. I know that I need exactly one and a half cups of that. All right, so I'm gonna put the millet into the hopper here. Just gonna start with a small amount. And it's kind of handy, I can set my measuring cup under here so I can get a closer estimate. It is quite loud. The raw millet has a pleasant, buttery smell. It ground pretty fast, and you can see it has a nice yellow color. So I just finished grinding my 25% millet. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the remaining 75% as the hard red spring wheat. So I'll take this over to the mill. So some of the grains grind really fast in the mill and some of them take longer. For example, spelt is really slow. The hard red spring wheat actually grinds up really fast, which I like. So again, I'm going to pour this into the hopper. Now I would be using five cups for the, for the remainder of this recipe, but as you learn when you're making bread by hand, you're always gonna add a little bit of flour 
gradually as you need along. So I, I want to make sure that I have more than five cups ground up. I will be using the Country Living Grain Mill for all of the grains in my video. This is a high quality, made in the USA, burr grinder. I've had this for many years. I purchased it with the motorization kit. It's nice to have the option to go off grid and hand grind it if you need to. I'm showing it running with the safety cover off so you can see the functioning parts. Look at the beautiful red hue of the hard red spring wheat. I love it. I also wanted to mention that you can adjust the coarseness and fineness of how coarse or fine the flour is ground by just simply turning this knob here, either clockwise or counterclockwise. So I have it set right now for pretty fine, but you can do a coarse if you wanted to see even crack a grain, for example, or down to as fine as like a pastry flour type of consistency. The first step is I need to proof my yeast. So I'm going to get two and a half cups of hot water. I'll be using a digital thermometer to measure. It needs to be 110 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit because I am doing bread by hand without a mixer. So we'll start by getting hot water out of the sink. And I will start with two and a half cups. And I will not add additional water. I will instead be adding additional flour throughout the process. So there I'm at my one half mark and I need two and a half. And then we'll go ahead and measure it to make sure that it's the correct temperature. This particular thermometer can go between Fahrenheit or Celsius. So we don't want to be over 115 or we risk killing the yeast. So this is great. We're right in between 110 to 115. Perfect. So next, rather than using refined sugar, I'm actually going to be using organic blackstrap molasses. Make sure it's not the grandma's molasses. You want to get blackstrap. So blackstrap molasses is actually really high in iron. So if you're a plant-based eater, it's a great source of iron and a great way to avoid refined sugars. We're going to be using two thirds cup, which is a lot, but I'm going to be making two loaves of bread with this. Okay, so we're going to add that to the hot water. And a second third. So I'll be using the same recipe for every single bread loaf that we make with all 11 of these grains. We want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples here and not changing the recipe. Okay, and then to this we will be adding five teaspoons of yeast. Now there's lots of different yeasts to choose from. That would be a topic for a whole nother video, but I'll be using Red Star's Quick Rise Instant Yeast. And I'll be measuring five teaspoons of yeast, which is quite a bit. One, two, three, four, and five. Next, we want to stir this up. So the black strap molasses is going to provide the sugar to feed the yeast. And the yeast will start to proof. It's going to bubble up and look foamy. I like to proof my yeast separately in a bowl. It's also a great way to make sure that the yeast is not dead and that it's, it's actually active. If it doesn't proof, you may have expired yeast and you wouldn't want to waste your flour that you just ground on that. 
long. I'm just going to give this a, a good little stir and let this sit. I'm going to let that sit for about five minutes and we'll come back when it's proofed. And we're ready with the yeast that is proofed. So this has been sitting for about five minutes and you can see how foamy and bubbly this is. So that's perfect, it's ready to go. In my large mixing bowl, I have the millet and the hard red spring wheat in the bowl. And we need to add three teaspoons of sea salt here. I'm gonna go ahead and dump that in. And I'm gonna start by just mixing that dry ingredients here with a spoon so that it's thoroughly blended. Then I'm gonna be adding and pouring in that proof yeast. So I do everything by hand. I do not have a stand mixer. Instead, I have just a really nice quality stainless steel bowl. This one happens to be Food Network and it has a nice rubber on the bottom so that it doesn't slide around on your counter. So it's really nice. I like having the depth to it. So once your dry ingredients are stirred, go ahead and pour in the proofed yeast. So I will begin by stirring this with a spoon. So the first stage here is stirring. Initially, this will be very sticky and wet and want to stick to the side of the bowl. So I will gradually be adding flour a little bit at a time in small increments. And it will be the hard red spring wheat. We don't want to add more millet because we want to keep that millet at 25% at or less. So I will gradually add additional hard red wheat until the stickiness is gone. It's very tactile. You can feel when it's ready to be kneaded. So you can see that this is very wet at this point here. This would not form into a ball well at all. And that black strap molasses really incorporates a nice dark color to the dough and as well as the finished bread. So this is not a sweet bread. This is going to be a little bit more on the bitter side with that molasses, but I really, I really enjoy it. So you can see I added a small amount here. We're gonna to continue to stir that in gradually. So I'll be switching over to my hands soon here. So we're talking like a quarter cup here at a time, just little bits at a time. You can always add more, just do, do it gradually. The hard red spring wheat has a really pretty red hue to it, as the name implies. Different grains will definitely absorb the water differently as well. So I'm going to set the spoon down now and I'm going to start using my hands and I'll continue adding more flour. So at this point it's very wet. I just want to start forming it into a ball. So that's very wet. So we're going to continue to add more. Now I'm starting to blend it with my hands rather than the spoon. So I keep it in the bowl when it's at this wet stage yet. As soon as, it, as that stickiness is gone and it's starting to form more of a ball, we'll do the kneading on the countertop. But we're not there yet. So 
again, gradually add more. I have a little bit of a sore finger as I slammed it on my wood splitter last weekend. So it's still a little tender to be kneading with that finger. So we're starting to get a little shape to it now, but it's still rather sticky and wet. So we're going to add more. The amount of flour that you add is not going to be the same every day or with every loaf that you're doing. It's going to vary. So it's very much a tactile thing. If you have a stand mixer, you will add flour gradually until it is no longer sticking to the side of the bowl. You do not need to spend the money on a stand mixer. Quality bowls in your hands are just fine. So now I'm starting to get into more of the kneading process, and I'll very soon be taking it out of the bowl. You can see it's starting to dry up and stay more formed into a dough bowl and not stick to the edges of the bowl. Now it may look like I've added too much flour here, but this will be incorporated in as we need. So now I'm ready to take this out of the bowl and right onto the counter. So this is where it gets a little bit more fun. Now we're going to start kneading this, this dough. So I feel like there's no right or wrong way to knead bread. I feel like there's so many different ways to get to your end goal with that. So do what works for you. If you want to get fancy and throw it up in the air, go ahead and do that. I actually find this part kind of enjoyable. It's a little bit relaxing, even though it is a good workout too. It certainly is tiring, but I like it. I just feel that bread making is so tactile. So when I knead, I like to use the palm of my hand quite a bit and push it and roll it like this. So you can see that I'm pushing into it the heel of my hand and turning it over. So the length of time that you do the kneading is going to vary depending on the grain that you're using. The temperature in the air, the humidity in the air, and really the way that I tell that we're ready is it's 100% tactile for me. It's the way it feels. It's, different, it's difficult to convey that on a video, so you need to just get the experience doing it yourself. So now I'm going to stop and I'm going to use a bench cutter to cut this in half. So I'm using a bench cutter so that I can divide this equally into two loaves of bread. So this one I got on Amazon. I'm just going to take the safety cover off. It's just a nice way to cut this dough in half. It's not that I'm going to be exactly equal in half, but it's certainly better than stretching it with your hands. The dough is going to be pretty stretchy at this point, so it's a lot easier to cut it in half like that. So now I have two, and now I'm going to knead the two dough balls separately because I'll be doing two separate loaves. So set one aside, and I'm going to continue to knead this one a little bit longer. So it's a little bit easier to work with the smaller, you know, a smaller dough ball. Thank you. 
So this is feeling really good here. So I'm ready to shape this to prepare it for my loaf pan. So basically, I just don't want to have any ugly, you know, ugly seams in the bread. So there's lots of different ways to do this, but I'm going to roll it. So I'm going to roll it with my hands like this. So I'll be using two glass Pyrex loaf pans. I really don't like to use Teflon or anything with chemicals in it, so I prefer glass or stainless steel. In my case, I, I really like my two glass um, bread pans. So I'm shaping this for a loaf pan, but you can shape bread in so many different ways. Dinner rolls, braids, you can have lots of fun with that. But we're doing two loaves. And for consistency, I want to do loaves for all of these grains that we're trialing. So if you look at, at this ball here, there really isn't too much of a seam. Maybe a little bit here, so I'll just put that face down. So I'm going to use two of the glass pans. Now I will need to spray it with something for nonstick. So I feel that a small amount of ex extra virgin olive oil <clears throat> is pretty, pretty good. I would rather have a small amount of oil compared to using a Teflon. So I'll lightly spray this. And I'm going to place this dough into the pan. And I'm going to use my fingers to kind of spread it out evenly into the pan and kind of shape it just a little bit more to fill the pan. Just kind of getting the corners filled in. So that's what that looks like. I'm going to do the exact same thing here with this second dough ball. So I'm going to need this one just a little bit longer as I did the previous one. So now that we have, now that we have these two finished loaves, these need to rise. So I'm going to give them approximately an hour and a half of rise time. I only do one rise. So we'll check back, and that time may vary, again, based on the temperature in the house, the humidity in the house. Um, I live in Minnesota, so it's cold here. Um, it could be negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or it could be 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it's going to vary. I find that in the summer months, it's going to rise a lot better. So what I'll be doing is covering this with a flour cloth towel. And I'll just be draping it over these loaves and checking back in an hour and a half to check the rise. One shortcut you can do is you can rise or proof your bread in an oven at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't like to do that way as much. I'd prefer to let it rise naturally because it is less likely to sink. So for the purpose of this video, we're going to do it consistently the same throughout each grain. So I'll we'll drape this towel over here. We'll check back in an hour and a half. So here we are looking at the 25% millet and 75% hard red wheat, and this is before the rise. So it's going to be flat and dense to begin with. After giving it about an hour and a half to rise, here's what it looks like with the flour sack towel removed. It's actually risen quite well, considering that millet is gluten free. All of the breads were baked at 375 degrees Fahrenheit for 35 minutes. Here we have the loaves removed from the oven and on a cooling rack. They do look quite attractive. Once the bread has thoroughly cooled, I went ahead and sliced it. Now we can take a close-up look of the texture of each slice. I do agree, as the description stated, that it does have a somewhat crumb-like texture. It was not so crumbly that it fell apart, 
it still had good binding. Overall, I thought that the millet combination was pleasant, and I would make this again. Unfortunately, I will not be able to grow millet here in Minnesota, as it does require a long and hot growing season. Millet is high in protein, iron, copper, and selenium. The next grain to showcase is amaranth. Now amaranth is another gluten-free grain, so we will be using it up to 25% of the flour in the recipe. It also has a mild and malt-like flavor. We will be combining it with the hard red spring wheat. So I will be using one and a half cups of amaranth. The amaranth ground at a fast speed. It is a small grain and I did not grind it on the finest setting. The texture is a bit sandy or gritty and I would describe the color as an off yellow. All right, so I have my amaranth in the mixing bowl here. And I'm just stirring, stirring it with the hard red spring wheat and the sea salt. And then you can see I've got the yeast proofed here, so this is ready to go. It has a distinct aroma to it. I didn't notice any smell with the millet, but the amaranth, I would say, has a very earthy smell to it. So it was unique. Here is the 25% amaranth before the rise. Here is the amaranth after the rise. As you can see, it did rise decently. However, I am not that impressed with the nutrient profile. The protein is fair, but the mineral content is pretty unimpressive. The finished texture was okay, but unfortunately, the taste was simply unpalatable. I give it a thumbs down. The taste was basically the same as the smell, and I did notice the smell when grinding the grain. So I'm not sure if it's the grain itself that I don't like, or if the grain was simply rancid or old. I think I will try popped amaranth to use it up. The next grain is Coruscant. I'm going to do a 50% Coruscant blended with 50% hard red spring wheat. And then I will also be doing a 100% Coruscant as well. So let's take this to the Country Living Grain Mill. One thing I like about Coruscant is it grinds really fast in the mill. You can also see that the berries themselves are really long compared to other wheat. The name of the wheat is Coruscant, while the registered trademark is Kamu, kind of like Tylenol is the name for acetaminophen. Coruscant is an ancient wheat that was rediscovered in Egypt and brought back to Montana. If you go to the website Kamu, you can read about the story in detail. Coruscant is a close relative of durum wheat, and durum wheat is the type used for pasta. The berries themselves are the largest that I have worked with. It gives a rich golden color, as you can see in this close-up. The Coruscant grinds into a very pretty golden color. And you can see that Coruscant is easily ground into a fine flour if you so choose. Here is the 50% Coruscant and 50% hard red before the rise. Cover your bread with a towel and wait one and a half hours to rise. Coming back, we can see that it has risen very well. I would expect this as both Coruscant and hard red have gluten in them. The dough is just slightly above the level of the pan and this is a good time to stop and bake it. 
Here are the loaves right out of the oven. They do look a little well done, but remember I am using the same cook time for every single recipe regardless of which grain I am using. I want to keep my results consistent. Truthfully, I would prefer overdone versus underdone. And the finished results of the 50% Khorasan. Despite it looking overdone on the outside, the internal of the bread is actually normal. It is not too dry and not too moist. Khorasan gets a thumbs up in my book. For comparison, we now have 100% Khorasan. This is before the rise. And after the rise and baked out of the oven, you can see that it rose quite well for being 100% Khorasan. Once again, you can see that the exterior did brown up a bit, but I do like it. Khorasan is described as a rich, buttery flavor, but in my opinion, I would describe it as a natural sweetness. I kind of compare it to corn. Khorasan is my husband's favorite grain. Now, it's one of my favorites, but I'm not sure I can commit to it being my number one favorite at this point, but it's definitely a runner-up. One thing we can both agree on is Khorasan is the best for muffins. I make a lot of vegan zucchini and pumpkin muffins, and Khorasan is hands down the best choice for these recipes. Our next grain is spelt. You can see that the berries are short, plump, and soft. This means that the grains will grind a lot slower on my mill. Spelt has been cultivated since approximately 5000 BC. Spelt was introduced to the US in the 1890s. First, I am mixing 50% spelt with 50% hard red. This is a very nice looking dough ball with a very smooth texture. So here we are looking at before the rise. Now we can see after the rise. Now this rose almost a little bit too much. You can see in the results that once I bake the bread, it has a sunken appearance on the top. Now it is very minimal, but to the trained eye, you can notice some sinking on the top. The finished texture of this combination resulted in a lighter bread. This would be expected of spelt. There are no air holes, but you can see that it is less dense. So tonight we're going to be making 100% spelt bread. So here's the spelt ground. Now remember, spelt is a very soft flour. So I really like to use 100% spelt for doing dinner rolls or buns where I want it to be soft. Also because it is so soft, it takes a lot longer to grind in the mill. So it's a softer grain, it's a slower grind. All right, here they are. So now we'll let these rise. We'll give them anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. We'll put that flour sack towel on them and we'll check back. The 100% spelt bread has risen and it is now ready to go into the oven. Out of the oven, you can see that the 100% spelt had slightly less sinking compared to the 50% blend of spelt. Spelt has a more delicate gluten structure, so you do not want to over knead. In fact, the directions on the feed sack stated to not knead for more than four minutes. I definitely agree that spelt has a lighter texture. You will not get a heavy or dense bread. This is why I prefer spelt for dinner rolls or buns. Another tip I have learned over the years is that spelt absorbs a lot more liquid. So either reduce the liquid in your recipe or increase the amount of flour that you are using. Spelt gets a thumbs up for me. The next grain is rye. We will do 100% rye as well as about 40% rye. The dark kernels of rye are familiar with what we know as pumpernickel bread. It grinds at a decent speed in the mill. 
Here is 100% rye before the rise. You can see that it is a dense bread. After the rise, there is basically zero rise. The reason is rye has less gluten than wheat. So you will result in a very dense bread. So as you can see, with 100% rye, I did not get any rise. Now, I don't like to waste food, so I went ahead and baked it anyways. According to the author in the book, Homegrown Whole Grains, using rye alone bakes into a heavy black loaf. Well, I would definitely say that that is an accurate description. Here they are out of the oven, and they are rather unpalatable. So I definitely do not recommend using pure rye for a yeast bread. Even my husband, who is not picky about bread, did not care for the 100% rye. To eat up these loaves, I dunked it into my homemade chili made with my homegrown tomatoes. Next, I will compare using 40% rye mixed with hard red. Before the rise, I'll admit this does not look very promising. It kind of looks the same as the 100% rye. Pressing on it, it does feel rather dense. After rising and baking, it did have a small amount of rise. It was better than zero with the 100% rye, but it was still pretty minimal. Some interesting facts about rye, it is the most cold hardy grain. Its seeds will germinate as low as 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It also has no hull. Although it doesn't need to be hulled, it still must be threshed to separate the kernels from the rest of the seed head. I have tried using rye in muffins, and I didn't really like the results of that either. Now I would like to try using rye for homemade crackers. For me, rye is just not a favorite. The next grain is einkorn. We will be doing 100% pure einkorn. The grains are expensive to purchase and only sold in smaller quantities. In my batch, there were a lot of weeds to pick out. Upon researching, it is difficult to separate the husk from the seed, so this makes it more difficult for threshing from the farmer's perspective. Einkorn is clearly a softer grain. I had to adjust my wheel to less fine to accommodate this grain. As you would expect with a softer grain, it is going to grind much slower. Previously, I had thought that spelt was the slowest grinding grain until I tried einkorn. I must say that einkorn is even slower than spelt. The mill can handle it just fine, but the time involved is a serious downfall for me. It also took a lot of grain to yield the amount of flour I needed. This canister was full at the beginning, and this is what's left over in order to make two loaves. Einkorn is the most primitive form of wheat. It contains only 14 chromosomes, whereas modern wheat contains 42. It is the oldest wheat known to scientists and is considered man's first wheat. As a seed saver myself, I love that we can be connected in a way to people from our past. Einkorn has less gluten than emmer. However, I do feel that the rise here was very adequate with no issues. Einkorn is low yielding, but it can survive on poor soils. Between the poor yield and the difficulty in threshing, I can understand the high cost. Out of the oven, it does have a nice dark exterior, which was very similar to the Coruscant. I can see little bits of chaff in the finished bread loaf that I didn't get removed. It definitely has a more rustic look to it. The finished result of the einkorn bread was positive, however, due to the cost and availability and the slow speed of grinding the wheat itself, this is not something I would be buying very often. So although the taste is fine, there would have to be some phenomenal nutritional benefits in order for me to justify the extra time and money involved. 
The next grain is emmer. And like einkorn, it is also sold in small quantities for a higher price. So we will be making 100% emmer bread. Emmer can also be called farro, especially in Italy. Technically, farro can refer to any of the ancient wheats, such as spelt, einkorn, and emmer. Along with einkorn, emmer was one of the first crops domesticated in the Near East. Emmer has been found in archaeological excavations and ancient tombs. The grain easily ground into a fine powder on the country living grain mill. Emmer was the primary wheat grown in Asia, Africa, and Europe throughout the first 5,000 years of recorded agriculture. It even predates Khorasan by over 4,000 years. Emmer is mentioned in the Bible in Exodus 9:32. All of the materials I use in these videos will be listed in the video description. Here is the emmer before the rise. I must say that emmer was the absolute most fun to work with. The dough is super elastic and it could be shaped into multiple forms. I've never worked with a dough that had this much elasticity. It was really fun. Here is the 100% emmer. It has risen and I'm ready to put it into the oven. Today's high is zero degrees and tomorrow's high will be minus three. So it's very cold in the house, it's very cold outside. And I'm really impressed with how much this rose. Very beautiful looking dough here. Here's a glimpse of the winter weather we were having on the day that I made the emmer. Despite the cold household temperatures, the emmer grain had by far the best rise of all the grains I've worked with. It even outperformed the hard red and the spelt in the rising abilities. Out of the oven, everything looked so perfect. I was so anxious to try eating this. Unfortunately, it had the same aroma and similar taste, only to a lesser extent, as the amaranth. If you recall, the amaranth had a very earthy, unpleasant, and unpalatable aroma. I really suspect that these two grains were simply expired or rancid, and that may account for the unpleasant aroma. I definitely want to try emmer again, but from a different source or a different batch. Emmer was by far the most fun to work with. The next candidate is buckwheat. Now buckwheat can be used in 20 to 40% of your recipe. It has no gluten and will not rise by itself. So today we are going to do 40% buckwheat and the remainder as hard red wheat. Buckwheat is not an actual wheat, rather the seeds are called groats. So they are buckwheat groats. It's surrounded by a dark hull. The hull can be left on for grinding into flour or removed. I've done it both ways. This particular batch is hulled, so the flour is a light color. If you leave the holes on, they are black in color and it will result in a darker and more bitter flower. I have grown buckwheat before. It was a rare variety with pink blossoms. I'd like to grow buckwheat again. Again, the mill does an excellent job at creating a fine flower. Eating buckwheat may lower your cholesterol and keep your blood sugar in check. It contains high levels of rutin a compound found in apples and citrus fruits that may make blood vessels stronger and more flexible. The seeds of buckwheat contain all of the amino acids, making the protein of high quality. In addition to the health benefits, look how nice of a rise I got by doing 40% buckwheat with the remaining hard red spring wheat. Buckwheat plants work great as a green manure to help improve your soil. They are also great for pollinators. To quote the author of Homegrown Whole Grains, she states, with buckwheat, there's no in-between. Either you love it or hate it. Its flavor is the strongest of any of the grains and its color the darkest. Well, I'm definitely in the camp of I love buckwheat. If it's too bitter for your liking, try to get the hold variety. Buckwheat is most commonly used for pancakes but I have a great vegan recipe for waffles. My husband also liked the buckwheat. Two thumbs up. 
The next grain is teff. Teff is the smallest grain in the world. 100 grains of teff equals about one kernel of wheat. Teff does not contain gluten. So I will be doing 25% teff and 75% hard red wheat. Teff is similar to quinoa in cooking, but the grain is much smaller. Here are the teff grains in a spoon for size reference. Because the teff grain is so small, I thought that I might need to use a coffee grinder to pulverize the grain. But lo and behold, the Country Living Grain Mill shined through beautifully. Not only did it work, but it was fast and it produced a nice fine powder. Next, I want to show you how beautiful the grain is in the bowl. The teff looks like a dark red sand and I'm mixing it with the hard red wheat. Here's a clip of how beautiful the dark red dough is. Here is the 25% teff before the rise. Because it is gluten free, you would anticipate not a high rise. But as you can see here, the rise was actually pretty decent. It still has that dark reddish brown color. Out of the oven, the loaves do look attractive. Teff originated in the Horn of Africa, grown for its edible seeds and its straw to feed cattle. Unfortunately, the cultivation of teff is labor intensive. The small size of its seeds makes it difficult to handle and transport. Teff is harvested two to six months after sowing, and it is harvested manually with a sickle. I liked the results of the teff. I found it to be very similar to the buckwheat and hard red blend. I think I liked the buckwheat slightly more than the teff, but they were very similar. The nutritional content of teff is good, and I would use teff flour again. I give it a thumbs up. The next grain is corn. What I have on hand is the white organic corn from Azure Standard. To grind corn in the Country Living Grain Mill, you will need to purchase the corn and bean auger, which is separate. I have ground white, yellow, blue, and multicolored corn with this machine. All of them worked well. You can choose fine or coarse when grinding corn. This example with the white corn is pretty fine. Corn grinds at a medium speed. To show another example, this is the organic blue corn purchased from Azure Standard. Normally I would grow the Mandan Bride multicolored corn that I grow here on my farm. Because corn is gluten free, I am doing 25% corn on the right hand side mixed with 75% of hard red wheat. This combination formed a nice dough ball. Using the bench cutter, I cut in half and continue with the two loaves. Here is the dough before the rise. After the rise, we have very good results. The bread again is above the level of the pan. It's just about perfect. You can really see the texture in the flour. After baking, the 25% corn looks great. I've been using corn for quite some time with this recipe and I'm always happy with the results. Did you know that there are several kinds of corn? Sweet corn, flour corn, dent or field corn, flint corn, and popcorn. Flint corn is rock hard inside and out. It grinds into a gritty flour. Flour corn has a thin outer covering over a soft starch interior. There is no sweetness and it grinds into a fine flour. I've always enjoyed using corn and I will continue to grow and use it. My husband also enjoys the corn, so it gets two thumbs up. The last grain in this video is hard red wheat. 
You could consider hard red wheat a modern day wheat. Because the modern wheat is higher in gluten, I am using it as the control. It is the point of comparison against which the other grains are measured. The individual whole wheat grains are called berries. So you would call them a wheat berry, just like you would call a buckwheat a buckwheat groat. Because hard red wheat is a hard grain, it grinds very fast in the mill. This is definitely a bonus for busy people that still want to make homemade bread. Did you know that there are hard wheats and soft wheats, and there is also winter wheat and spring wheat? Here is the 100% hard red wheat before the rise. As the name suggests, it is red in color. Specifically, the hard red spring wheat is higher in protein and gluten. You can see that we have a good rise, but not 100% perfect. Variables such as the room temperature and humidity will affect the rise. Regardless, the modern wheats are a sure bet. Modern wheat breeding developed in the first years of the 20th century and was closely linked to the development of Mendelian genetics. The standard method of breeding is by crossing two lines using hand emasculation, then selfing or inbreeding the progeny. Selections are identified 10 or more generations before release as a variety or cultivar. I demonstrate this method with tomato breeding step by step on a video in my channel. With the excellent nutrient profile, the fast speed of grinding the grain, and the affordability, hard red wheat is definitely a winner for me. It's excellent alone or mixed with many other grains. If you made it to the end, thank you. If you got any value out of this video, please like, subscribe, or leave a comment. All of the resources will be in the video description. Now go and make some bread.